Okay, is that better? Okay, so first I'll be discussing community detection, also known as a graph clustering. And second, I'll be discussing graph alignment. Uh, and the reason why I like those two uh, learning problems related to graphs are threefold. Uh, first, they each have uh, lots of applications. So community detection is useful for uh, recommender engines or for clustering proteins in protein-protein interaction networks, whereas uh, graph alignment is useful for de-anonymizing uh, social uh, network data and also applications in biology. So first off, you know that if you have an interesting algorithm for one of these tasks, you may have some practical impact, which is not bad. Second, uh, they have a nice mathematical structure. They are to some extent tractable. There are non-trivial things that can be said about them. And uh, finally, uh, uh, they uh, show some light on a very intriguing phenomenon that arises in, in many of these uh, high dimensional learning problems, which is the existence of what is known as a hard phase. That is a phase where we uh, know that a brute force algorithm can extract some useful signal from the observation, whereas we don't know of any polynomial time algorithm that will succeed at extracting this uh, signal. So there, there are, uh, I mean, ways for us to uh, have a look at the existence of this hard phase. And OK, we don't quite understand it, but these are uh, our entry points in trying to understand them better. All right. So uh, my outline uh, will be as follows. The first uh, three talks, uh, the thing is, if I want to annotate, uh, yeah, I hope you can read with this. Uh, OK, uh, le let me try to do full screen and. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. So uh, first off, uh, community detection, I, I'll uh, talk for three, uh, uh, three hours about that roughly. Um, and then uh, uh, the last three sessions uh, will be on graph alignment. Uh, actually, I will start with something that is motivated by, uh, by community detection, but that is uh, not community detection per se. This is the so-called tree uh, reconstruction uh, problem. And that will uh, uh, allow me to introduce uh, what is known as the keston stigum uh, phase transition or keston stigum threshold. And we will see later on why this is relevant to the uh, problem of community detection in random graphs that we will uh, uh, discuss uh, after the first, uh, the first lecture. All right, so let's get started with uh, tree reconstruction and the uh, keston stigum threshold. Uh, all right, so. Uh, what is the tree reconstruction problem? Well, uh, this is the following thing. Uh, assume you are given a genealogical uh, tree. You have an ancestor. It has its children, and they have their own children, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's uh, the uh, genealogical tree. And then we have some uh, traits that are, are traits that are carried by each of the individuals. So that could be, if uh, these were uh, human beings, that could be the colors of their eyes, so blue eyes, brown eyes. Uh, and uh, we will talk about traits or, or spins. Uh, since we are in a physics center, this will be mostly spins. And so um, we have a, a probabilistic mechanism for the transmission of traits from parent to children. We have, uh, we will uh, give us uh, uh, probability transition matrix that has as many rows and columns as there are traits. So far as the number of traits will be Q. Uh, the most basic example will, will be Q equals two, but we will uh, allow ourselves uh, uh, any value, finite value for Q. Uh, and so uh, uh, the transmission of traits will be probabilistic and independently for each uh, parent-child uh, relationship. So this is why we have the formula uh, that I, I write here. So I wanted to be able to highlight things as we go. Okay, maybe this is not a good color. Huh? Okay, let's try something a bit. Uh, uh, yes. Okay, so that's my uh, probabilistic transmission mechanism. So given the, the tree, uh, I transmit trait, uh, uh, trait uh, J to uh, my child uh, given that I have trait i with probability pij. And so uh, that's the only uh, thing I need to uh, 
specify the, the tree uh, that I'm considering, uh, this stochastic matrix P. And I'll assume it's irreducible so that it has a unique uh, invariant distribution that I'll uh, um, denote by nu. And uh, I'll assume to complete the description that the trait of the ancestor is distributed according to the stationary distribution. So if you marginalize things, you can figure out very easily that the trait of a, a descendant is also distributed according to nu because it's just, you know, there's a Markov chain of propagation from the ancestor to that descendant. And so we start in stationary state, we stay in stationary state. So what is the tree uh, reconstruction problem? Uh, okay. It's the following thing. <clears throat> it's, uh, okay. It's uh, given the observation of the tree and given the observation of the traits of some individuals at uh, generation D, uh, can you infer non-trivially what was the trait of the ancestor? So given uh, the population on Earth's eyes colors today, can we infer the uh, eyes colors of Eve, where they blue or, or uh, brown? Maybe other possibilities exist, but uh, that, that's the gist of it. So uh, can we infer non-trivially the trait of the ancestor given the traits of the and descendants far away uh, as we let the generation D uh, go to infinity. Uh, I have not said what our tree will be. Uh, our tree will be for us either a deterministic tree, we'll assume it's given, it has such and such property, but most of the time we'll assume it's a, a probabilistic uh, tree, it's a Galton Watson branching tree. So for instance, you assume that each individual has a random number of children that is a Poisson distributed random variable. Okay, uh, so uh, let me uh, recall some notation. Uh, I think it's just a, a recap of notation for most of you, because uh, I've seen at least in the last talk, neutral information was presented. So let's just uh, 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 set the notation right. H will stand for the entropy of a distribution. So H of nu is the entropy, Shannon entropy of the uh, stationary distribution of our uh, uh, stochastic matrix P. Conditional entropy uh, is, uh, uh, can be defined in many ways. So conditional entropy of a pair of random variables is the joint entropy minus the entropy of the conditioning variable. Uh, and mutual information can be defined again in many ways. So uh, mutual information between variables X and Y can be defined as the sum of entropies of X and of Y minus the joint entropy. Uh, and it's also the kullback leibler divergence between the joint distribution and the product distribution of the marginals. So that's uh, probably the most useful uh, uh, characterization of, of uh, a mutual information. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, so more uh, background on information theory. There's also a notion of a conditional mutual information. Uh, and basically this is the expectation uh, of the uh, kullback leibler divergence between the conditional distribution of two variables X and Y conditioned on Z uh, with respect to the products of the uh, conditional distribution P of X given Z, P of Y given Z, and you average that over the, the conditioning random variables. So that's conditional inform uh, uh, mutual information. Uh, and well, for now, the one thing that we will uh, uh, get from this, that we will use, is uh, the fact that if you have, so uh, I guess I can write this, if we have uh, uh, the following uh, uh, um, uh, dependence diagram, as I state in the lemma, I have X and Y that are conditionally independent given Z. So uh, it's sometimes uh, depicted by this dependence diagram. Conditionally on Z, there's no dependence between, between X and Y. Then the mutual information between X and Y is no more than the mutual information between X and Z. And so this is something that you can uh, easily derive from basic formulas for mutual information. So this is known as the data processing inequality, this uh, inequality. All right, so that's, that's where we'll need uh, uh, for now. Okay, and so uh, 
that will allow us to uh, uh, precise mathematically what we uh, uh, mean by non-trivial tree reconstruction. Basically, we'll say that non-trivial tree reconstruction holds if the mutual information between the spin at the root, the thing we are interested in, and what we get to observe, that is uh, the tree itself plus the traits or the spins of the uh, nodes at generation D, the mutual information between those things does not go to zero as D goes to infinity. And we do know that a limit exists as D goes to infinity for this mutual information, because if you look at, uh, you know, you have uh, the root R here, it's spin sigma R, then you look at the tree down to depth D, and then you have node I here and sigma I, okay? Given our probabilistic uh, mechanism for transmission, uh, <clears throat> there is such a conditional independence diagram. So uh, if I knew uh, the spin <coughs> uh, at generation D, then what happens at generation D plus one is conditionally independent from uh, the spin at the root. Yes? Yes. You you typically will get exponentially many nodes because we are going to look at branching processes. So typically at generation D, you have an exponential in D number of individuals. You look at all these values. And it turns out that in some cases you have uh, uh, non-vanishing information about the spin at the root. And in other cases, uh, this information vanishes. There is no thing you can uh, figure out from uh, uh, the roots spin. Yes, yes, we'll, we'll take discrete set for the spin values. So think of uh, uh, binary values or uh, any finite values, uh, actually, uh, we will be uh, uh, considering, but uh, think of two values to set ideas. Yes? Yes, yes. What I'll describe uh, is assuming I know everything about the, the tree uh, itself, as well as the uh, probabilistic uh, mechanisms. So that is to say the, the transition matrix. I, I'll assume I know all that, yeah. Uh, all right, so as I was saying, we can apply this data processing inequality. We know the mutual information decreases, so it has a limit. So either it goes to zero or it goes to something positive. If positive, we say uh, reconstruction is feasible, otherwise it's not. Okay, and we want to understand when it is, when it is not. Uh, so that's the first problem, and we'll see some characterization based on the data, the, the, the uh, parameters of the problem that, that uh, uh, determines uh, reconstructibility or non-reconstructibility. Uh, and let me describe uh, right now a second uh, reconstruction problem uh, that, okay. Uh, but before I do that, okay, let me just say one more word before I move to the other reconstruction problem, one more word about uh, this kind of reconstruction. Uh, it turns out that uh, you cannot reconstruct if and only if the conditional distribution of the spin at the root, the spin of the ancestor, given what you observe uh, at generation D, uh, this conditional distribution uh, uh, converges in probability to the unconditional distribution that is new. So that is something uh, that you can prove in a few lines, and this is on the slide, but I won't do it. So uh, maybe we can put the slides off online and you can, you can read that uh, at your leisure uh, if you feel like it. Okay, one, one more word about this non-reconstructibility. Assume you have a, a symmetric distribution for the spin uh, uh, at the root. So it's a uniform distribution uh, on the Q values that it can take. So in binary spin, one half, one half, uh, Q values, uh, one over Q for each of the, of the Q values. Um, so by what I just said, uh, you can see that non-reconstructibility holds if and only if the maximum of, of the conditional probabilities uh, of uh, the value of the spin at the root, given what you observe down at generation D, converges to one over Q, okay? It's the same thing 
to have the distribution converge to the uniform as to have the maximum converge to one over Q. Uh, and uh, uh, a way to understand this non reconstructibility property is then the following. Uh, it will hold if and only if for the best estimator that you can construct from the spin uh, of the spin at the root sigma hat uh, of, of uh, the spin at the root sigma r, then uh, and under the assumption of non reconstructibility, the probability that you guess right will converge to one over q, whatever, no matter how smart you are, because uh, you can, you know that the uh, a way to maximize this probability of guessing right is to guess at the uh, uh, trait that maximizes the uh, uh, conditional uh, uh, probability. And so since this conditional probability converges to one over Q, that's, that's the performance you get. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's a trivial performance that you can achieve by guessing at random. Okay, so uh, that's, that's a way to understand this property. So let's, let's uh, consider a second uh, kind of uh, reconstructibility property, which we call census reconstructibility. And uh, uh, this is the same question. Can we guess about the spin at the root? But we give ourselves less information instead of uh, having all the details about the tree down to generation D, as well as the individual spins at generation D. We get summaries. We get the census of uh, how many individuals down at generation D have a particular spin. So we get a Q-dimensional vector of counts, of spin counts at generation D, so less information. Uh, all right, and we say uh, census reconstructibility holds if the mutual information between the spin at the root and this uh, lesser uh, set of information goes uh, to something positive and non-reconstructibility, census reconstructibility holds if it goes to zero. Uh, so uh, an easy remark that we can make again using this uh, data processing inequality, this uh, uh, you know, monotonicity of uh, mutual information is that uh, uh, the mutual information between the spin at the root and the census at generation D decreases with D once more, because uh, given the census at generation D, the census at generation D plus one and the spin at, at the root are conditionally independent. Okay, so there's a limit. And we can tell as well that uh, uh, the mutual information is less because we have less information. Okay, that makes sense intuitively, but you can prove it using this uh, data processing inequality. Uh, so if we have census reconstructibility, we certainly have ordinary reconstructivity. Okay, so uh, I said uh, in the title, a uh, Keston Stigum threshold, and that's now that it's going to appear. So uh, we, will, uh, we will make a link between uh, this property of census reconstructibility and a, a particular threshold on the uh, parameters of the model, specifically the spectrum of the uh, matrix P, as well as the average number of children per node in our, in our uh, tree. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a, a, a close relationship between uh, the two. And for that, we'll assume that the, the tree is a branching tree, so Galton Watson branching tree, and we will make two assumptions on that tree. We'll assume uh, the average number of children is some constant alpha, strictly larger than one. So there's a non zero probability that it survives. And if it survives, it tends to uh, grow exponentially fast with the generation. Okay, and we'll assume as well that there's a finite second moment for this number of children. Uh, ah, yes. Okay, so uh, here's one way to do it. You uh, start off with an ancestor, uh, then you sample, uh, okay, you sample, uh, you give yourself random variables x, d, i, for D larger than one and I uh, larger than one, that are I, I, D, and that follow the same law as some uh, variable Y in our case. So it could be a Poisson variable with parameter alpha, if you like. And so <coughs> we uh, assign to the uh, ancestor, which is at generation zero, at level zero, we assign it 
uh, okay, maybe I, I start at zero here. Uh, X zero one children, okay? And then I'll uh, uh, keep track of these children. And for each of the children, I'll assign a number of uh, children. So first child will get X one one children. Second child will get X one two children and so on and so forth. Third child will get X one three. And I can uh, iterate. So uh, at, gener at the following generation, I'll use the first index to track generation. And then I'll uh, end each of the individual uh, in individuals with uh, its number of children. So it's, it's a, a random tree that is generated in this iterative manner by having IID numbers of children. Okay. Uh, and it's been proposed in 1873 by Sir Francis Galton as a way to uh, describe the number of individuals of a noble family in uh, England. And uh, he asked the question, can you predict whether this family will survive or going extinct? Okay, so he asked the question and then there was an answer posed by uh, uh, Reverend Watson in a, a naming and journal of the time. Uh, and he uh, proposed a solution for that. There's a fixed point equation involving the generating function of this random variable describing the law of the number of children. And uh, okay, and apparently it was false, the answer provided by Reverend Watson. And some say it should not be called uh, Galton Watson, it should be called uh, Bianne something, or, but uh, I don't think, I think this is a lost battle. All right, so that, that's what we are looking at. So, so for reconstruction without census, we assume we are, uh, we observe the full tree. So we, we know everything about the tree, but we only observe the traits of the children down at generation D. We, yes, you, you uh, stop it at generation D and you observe the spins of the leaves once you have cut things below generation D. But if you are given the information of the tree uh, downstream, it, it's of no use because of conditional independence. Uh, so uh, that, that's what it is. So uh, reconstruction, you want to guess the, the spin at the root, you're uh, given the whole tree and the spins only at generation D. Yes, you, you get to see the spins only at generation D. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, we have this Galton Watson uh, tree. We have alpha, the average number of children. Second moment is finite. Okay. We have the uh, transition matrix P and we'll uh, uh, care about its spectrum. And so we'll denote by lambda two of P, the uh, eigenvalue of P with second largest modulus. And we know it's a stochastic matrix. So the largest modulus is one since it's irreducible. Uh, it could have a second largest uh, uh, modulus of one as well. If you have, for instance, minus one, uh, if you have a periodic chain, but uh, okay. So lambda two, is the eigenvalue with second largest modulus for this uh, transition matrix. Okay, uh, so the theorem we have, first theorem, in one direction, we'll see there's a converse, is that if alpha average number of children times uh, the square of the modulus of lambda two is strictly larger than one, then census reconstructibility holds. So I'll, I'll uh, uh, spend a bit of time explaining you how this gets to, to be shown. Um, so uh, there's a, a, a construction you, you can make that involves uh, an eigenvalue that is associated with lambda two, this uh, eigenvalue of, of P. So I give myself uh, uh, this, uh, oh, maybe I don't need to rewrite what's on the, uh, the slides. So X is a, uh, Q-dimensional vector that is an eigenvector associated 
uh, uh, with uh, lambda two. So you have p uh, x <coughs> equals lambda two uh, x, right? Uh, and uh, we'll uh, construct a statistics from our census vector. We'll, uh, we'll uh, construct the statistics ZD, which is the sum of our possible traits of individuals. And then we'll have, okay, let me denote traits by letter S. We'll uh, uh, average, uh, We'll take a sum of our traits, possible traits of uh, the entry of the eigenvector for that trait times x s z. If you recall, this is the number of individuals with a trait s at generation d, and we have a, a rescaling a quantity which is alpha lambda two uh, to the minus d. Okay, so that's our statistic, and uh, we'll be able uh, to show that uh, uh, census reconstructability holds. Re remember, this means that the mutual information between the spin at the root and this vector x s d uh, does not vanish by showing that, in fact, the information between the spin at the root and this statistic does not vanish. OK, uh, so how do we do that? Well, we leverage uh, Martingale theory. So I, I don't know uh, if that is something that is familiar to uh, many of you here. No, no one uh, is too familiar with Martingale theory. So that's one of the achievements of probability theory in the 20th century. So it's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, a, a notion that generalizes independence and you can prove theorems like law of large numbers, central limit theorems, when you have Martingale structure, concentration inequalities. Many things hold when you can exhibit a Martingale that you know to hold uh, for uh, sequences of variables that are uh, that are, that have a stronger form of independence. So wh what is a martingale? This is a sequence of random variables uh, uh, m sub d for uh, uh, step d. Let's uh, consider discrete time here. Uh, d is the uh, discrete time for us. Uh, so we have a martingale uh, with respect to uh, an increasing uh, uh, family of uh, sigma fields of uh, uh, sigma fields uh, G sub D, if and only if the conditional expectation of M at time D plus one, given the information G sub D at time T at time D, is equal to M D. All right. So it's. Uh, a process that is uh, conditionally centered, if you like. Uh, we need uh, to state the, the uh, central result in the theory of Martingale's an extra uh, uh, definition, uh, which is uniform integrability. Uh, so this is the notion uh, 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 on the slide here. A family of random variables is uniformly integrable if uh, uh, uniformly, the expectation of these random variables on a set where they are uh, in absolute value above a large threshold A, uniformly over the set, this goes to zero as you move the threshold to infinity. So they, they may have, you know, uh, an expectation that is bounded, but some of them may achieve this expectation of one, say, by having a, a, a little bit of mass very far away from one. Uh, and uh, you could have bounded uh, expectations without uniform integrability if you had somehow uh, uh, some of the expectation moving to infinity. So uniform integrability precludes that. OK, and so the, the central result in Martingale theory is that if you have a Martingale, if it's uniformly integrable, then uh, it uh, converges uh, almost surely and in uh, L1 uh, to a limiting random variable. And so if you denote by M infinity the uh, limit of this martingale, then uh, the uh, uh, value taken by the martingale at some finite time D is the conditional expectation of the uh, uh, limiting variable uh, conditioned on the information at time D. Okay. So MD is expectation of M infinity conditioned on G sub D. 
Okay, uh, and for the record, we'll, we'll use that. There's, well, there, there's a whole a body of results on martingales, but uh, so what I was uh, stating now is the uh, central result on convergence of martingales. There's a somewhat easier result that we might uh, need later on is uh, uh, convergence for what we call backward martingales. And the backward martingale is, is the following thing. Instead of having an increasing sequence of sigma fields, you may consider a decreasing sequence of sigma fields. Okay. Uh, and for us, what it will amount to, it will amount to uh, uh, considering the information below generation D. And as I move D, uh, as I increase D, I get less and less information. Okay. And so a decreasing, for a decreasing sequence of, of sigma fields, uh, of sigma fields H sub D, if I consider a random variable x sub d, that is the conditional expectation of x given h sub d, uh, then we have a convergence almost truly n l1 of x sub d to the uh, 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 expectation of the uh, variable we use to define this backward martingale conditioned on the information at infinity. So if we have a decreasing sequence of sigma fields, you can define the limiting sigma field at infinity. So uh, there's, a, there's such a notion of H infinity and we have this backward convergence marking. Okay, um, let's see. So uh, the proof of the lemma is, is a, a simple calculation. So uh, I, I have the details here. I, I will be less, uh, give less and less details as I proceed over the days, but uh, okay, let's see some details now. Uh, so remember, I have my statistics, which is a weighted sum of the uh, uh, census vectors coordinates, and I want to show that this is a uniformly integrable martingale. And so for this, I prove first that it is a martingale. So I look at the conditional expectation of my statistics uh, uh, ZD conditioned on the information uh, at generation uh, D minus one. And so uh, I can pull out the normalization uh, term here. Okay. And so I have a conditional expectation of a sum and I can put together the spins of uh, individuals at generation D according to their uh, father or mother, their parent. And that, this is what I do. So I sum over uh, individuals I uh, in, Okay, I have not introduced this notation. L d minus one for me. This is the leaves at uh, uh, level d minus one, so meaning the nodes uh, at generation d minus one. So I have a sum over nodes at generation d minus one of a sum over their children, so j uh, such that the parent of j is i for a given i, and then I have uh, uh, x sigma j, the spin of that child uh, j. Okay, so this is really a, a re rewriting of ZD that I have done and I have pulled out the renormalization factor. All right, so uh, now I can use uh, uh, what I know about the construction of a tree. This is a branching tree uh, according to the Galton-Watson branching mechanism. So I know that one individual has an average alpha children. Okay, so I, I will have a factor alpha that comes out from that. And then uh, I will, for one child, condition, uh, uh, condition on the spin of its parent and average over the values of its own spin. So that's going to be a sum of a possible values of its spin uh, of uh, the transition probability P sigma s times uh, x s. And so this is where I use the fact that I have uh, used an uh, eigenvector of P. So that is exactly lambda two times uh, X uh, sigma I. And this is how I get that uh, my process is indeed a martingale. A martingale. And I have not used at all this kesten stigum threshold condition uh, alpha times lambda two squared uh, larger than one. This property, the fact that it is a martingale holds without the, the condition. So, uh, where I need the uh, kesten stigum condition is to show that it is uniformly integrable. And so uh, to show that I can use a, a criterion that is, a, 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 it's how it's usually done when you want to show that a family of, uh, of uh, variables is uniformly integrable. 
you establish a bound on some uh, moment of order larger than one. So one plus epsilon works, uh, two definitely works. And so if you can bound the second moments of uh, 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 random variables uniformly over them, then you get uniform integrability uh, at once. So that's what we do. We bound, so we know a bound on the expectation because we have a martingale, so all expectations are the same. So what we need to do now is uh, come up with a bound on the variance, and that's what we do. Uh, so I don't know if I want to detail all of that, uh, but what, uh, it boils down to the following. If you look at the variance of our statistics at generation D, you apply what is known as the conditional variance formula and you, you get a result easily. Uh, and uh, this result uh, uh, separates into two contributions. You have the variance of the statistics at generation D minus one plus something that you can bound and you can bound it by something that is uh, uh, proportional to uh, an exponential in D term. And this uh, term that is raised to the power D is precisely one over this alpha times lambda two squared. Okay. And so that's where the uh, uh, kesten stigum threshold uh, holds. Uh, since we assume alpha lambda two squared larger than one, we know that we uh, are adding a contribution to go from variance at uh, step D minus one to variance at step D that has a finite sum. So the variances are uniformly bounded. Okay, so that's how we get uh, uh, uniform integrability. Okay, uh, and so uh, there's a bit more work to show uh, that uh, because of this uniform integrability, there is non-vanishing mutual information between the spin at the root and the uh, census at generation D, uh, but. Uh, I don't know if I want to go uh, through the details, but that, that's the key step of showing uniform integrability. And after you have that, you need uh, uh, a few uh, arguments to show that uh, necessarily there must be some T such that the mutual information between the probability that this statistic Z, uh, that the fact that the event ZD less than some threshold T and the spin at the root, they have non-vanishing mutual information. Okay. So um, the, 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 one of the key ideas here is to understand which is the proper statistics, which is a martingale so that you can use these results, right? So yes. is there a kind of intuition? Uh, how do you guess that this is a correct statistics, uh, this ZD? Well, I, I don't know if there is a very clever uh, answer to that. I mean, you try linear statistics. Okay. And uh, you have, okay. You have a, a conditional expectation of a linear transform, then P shows up. Okay. So okay. if you want to martingale, once you look for uh, linear statistics, naturally you'll want to use uh, uh, weights that come from eigenvectors of P. And so, uh, why a priori the, 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 so the one associated to the second eigenvalue is because you knew in advance that the second eigenvalue is related to that threshold from physics or? Uh... No, no, uh, it, uh, it's because uh, you can use the first eigenvalue and you'll get something, uh, uh, you'll get uh, a martingale as well. It will be uniformly integrable. But then at generation zero, the martingale that you get uh, is a constant. It equals one. Okay. And so it's something that is not correlated with uh, the spin at the root. So okay. you need to go to uh, higher order eigenvectors. So okay. you want to go to at least lambda two. And, but the larger the modulus, the better it is to ensure uh, uniform integrability. Okay. So you just go to the uh, second largest uh, okay. modulus. Okay, so there's, there's no freedom. This is the one statistic you want to use in the end. Okay. No, 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 you cannot. Actually, there, as I was saying, there's a converse. So, uh, so this is as good as it gets. So maybe I can, I can move to, to that now. Uh,
I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm so that's that that's in the past yes so tomorrow then okay 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 that's fine